Tracy Fry. Um, this is Dave Fowler. We're from Federal Trappers here in Wyoming. I've been here, uh, what do I got, 30 years? Uh, I've been here 14. 14 years. Um, and we handle a wide variety of things in this county. We've got lots of different ecosystems, lots of different animals. Um, and everything from occasionally um, catching a grizzly bear down to getting a rattlesnake out of somebody's garage or something. We get, we get all kinds of calls. Rats, bats, cats, you name it. So, um, in the past year, I was just talking to Alan there, you know, in the past year, our coyote population seems to be pretty low. And in 30 years here, I, I've noticed about three different times that when that happens, it's because about three years earlier, the, the rabbit population tanks really bad. And usually when the rabbits come back about three years later, the coyotes start to explode. So it's been, our line of work's been fairly quiet on the coyotes in, in the last year. Um, we historically have done a, a whole lot of wolf work in the county here. Uh, I was here when they first uh, released them. I caught the first wolf here in Fremont County up on the Junor River, uh, Du Bois, Diamond G. But uh, Dave shot one like a year ago or something in Rolander. Yeah, and then had the mange with it. Yeah, it was really mange. And then I took one uh, in a coyote trap last spring up by Crowheart. But it's been really light on the wolves the last two years at least. Um, I think even the guys on the grazing allotments have been pretty low on the wolf issues. I think it's been more bear, hasn't it, Jim? combination of things but I know they did get main drill bad here what was it three years ago or so that had an effect on the population I think they didn't raise as many young ones that year um, and then we've had hunting seasons on them too so and I think that's made a difference um, I think the overall wolf damage in the county is down to a pretty good manageable level I think there might be a couple of cattle guys that don't think that but I think most of them are not really having too much an issue with, with wolves at least so, yeah but historically we've had a, um, a lot of wolf work when this first started it was in 96 turned them loose um, it was about a year later I caught one on the Junor circle on that. Um, all we could do was uh, trap and hit a uh, telemetry call on like the first or I don't know, first two or three years or something like that. And, uh, you know, I knew about as much about wolves as I knew brain surgery at the time. I mean, I just had no idea that the, the traps were what you had to have. And it was a pretty sharp learning curve on that deal. So, um, like I say, now it's uh, we the only state that's got a predator. Yep. The only state, one of these only state that has a predator status on the wolves. So that, that's saying something about our state. Um, anybody have any questions? Or Are you hearing much from producers on just a readback of the harassment from the wolves and a much, a little bit more from just the kill? Uh, we haven't heard a lot lately. Have you heard much? On I haven't that? heard a lot. That's one of those things that's really hard to quantify, and it absolutely happens. Also, pasture usage, um, you know, uh, manpower. Also, you got a you got a cowboy that's got to push his cattle back up to the top where they want them every every morning because either bear, grizzly bear, or a wolf gets in them, and, and even if they don't kill them, they move them down, and those cows after a while they don't like that and start moving down low out of those areas and it's it's a constant battle on that so there is a lot of costs associated with it that you can't quantify it really yeah yeah we've seen several cases where they just run the cows and calves through the, the fence you know like up at two boys and stuff and that's not good for stuff either and, um, wolves and coyotes but wolves are a little more apt to just go at that um, you know you hear people say Coyotes don't kill calves. Well, that's kind of a, a 
yes or no answer. They don't seem to just outright kill a lot of calves. What coyotes do, they're highly intelligent. And they, if, if you get two or three coyotes to harass a, a mama cow and a newborn calf, she is usually the next step in line to try and get defended against the coyotes. And that's how it happens. That's what you get when you say the coyotes get it inadvertently. And, and that happens. I haven't, no. No, they typically do that, well, right now, when the snow's on good, and they can catch them or see them, it's a lot easier. Yeah. I was just wondering if maybe you guys would put in a good word and say, well, we can capture a lot of them, put a lot of collars on them. And we don't really have any say on that, you know, but they've been pretty good at keeping collars on them. They have to, to keep, you know, they've got to be able to prove what we've got and we've got so many breeding pairs and all that without those collars they can't they can't prove that and then we're going to be back up against the lawsuit again so i think they've been doing a pretty good job and in the past they've actually collared a few that we asked them to try to get a collar on that maybe were in a predator area but right on the fringe and, and they would pass through that country and if they got a chance to do that which helped us quite a bit so One uh, related thing is um, historically when we've had like wolf trouble in the summer, um, you know, high elevation. I mean, I've got quite a few wolves out of an airplane, but it, it's a lot safer out of the helicopter. But the trouble we've had is we only had one outfit, Sky Aviation, in the state that uh, was set up to do that kind of work where we could go get wolves if we needed to. Our state supervisor in Casper was able to finagle a deal to get an ex-military helicopter of L206 um, for us, family crew. Um, so we now have a pilot and a helicopter set here and everything. So that's going to make things way easier in the future. We could do it either that day or the next day. Should happen today. Have you had a chance to meet with them? We have not yet seen Fort Collins right now. You know, we should have had this thing six months ago, but with the COVID, you know, they had travel restrictions and they couldn't do this and couldn't do that. And it's kind of drug on, but we, we finally got fixed. And it's going to be all oh, about $200 an hour cheaper to use our own versus hiring one out. So, yeah. What is the cost to run your shopper? Seven dollars An hour? Yeah. We've got a fuel trailer. Now, Tracy touched on uh, a little bit of something when he first started talking about the broad variety of things that we deal with. And I've dealt with a lot of, I guess I'd say non-predator critters. Um, it's kind of interesting and we've done some studies and stuff on them. Uh, you know, I've done some work on uh, vultures, trying to scare them, harass them mostly. People are having them roost in their yards and it's it's really nasty if you got 50 buzzards roosting in your yard it's it's pretty bad and they'll 
this has happened in Lander and Riverton and Pavilion that I know of in, in the county. You know, if they'd go down on the river in somebody's back for and roost down there, they wouldn't bother anybody. But when they're when they're crapping and puking all over in your front yard, it's a real mess and a hell hazard. <laughs> yeah, um, I've helped with that. Uh, you know, we've, we've been doing uh, ongoing rabies surveillance in the state for, I don't know, that's been going on for quite a while. Um, through our regular duties, we try to catch a few skunks every year and turn the heads in for rabies uh, surveillance. Uh, I think we turned in 17 heads in the county last year uh, for, of skunk. Uh, I don't believe it was in, in Fremont, but I know I was talking to the state director the other day and we did have one, one hot uh, sample last year. And I wish I could tell you what county it was in, but I don't know what county it was. I'm pretty sure it was not Fremont, so um, I did that. Uh, you know, I've been involved in uh, the Baileyus Asterisk Procyonis roundworm study we did here in the state and then in the county. The state biologist is interested in doing some of that stuff and I've, I'm always willing to supply samples for them. That's just a roundworm that occurs in raccoons. Um, it can be um, pretty dangerous to humans if you get it. Um, but uh, we, we did some studying and sampling and about 75% of the raccoons in the state have it. Um, carry it, which is was typical. I did a study in Oregon also on that, and that was about what we found. Um, really, you know, raccoons have a habit of using a latrine or a specific place to crap, and uh, a lot of times it could be maybe on your wood pile or something. So the way to get that would be not washing your hands, bring firewood and don't wash your hands, and then eat something like that. that it's possible to get that. It's not real common in humans, but you don't want that in your system. It gets in the, the roundworms migrate into the central nervous system, and then you can. That, that's a bad deal. It's real hard to get rid of them. Another thing we did. Some of some of you might be interested in this. The endococcus uh, worm is a. It's a parasite that's uh, mostly in wolves and ungulates, and we did some testing. We want, a biologist wanted to do some testing, and when I was when we were taking a lot more wolves in the county, I was providing samples with those wolves, and I think we had about 30 wolf samples, and probably oh, two or three hundred coyote samples that were were submitted across the state. The wolves ran; they were running between 50 and 75 percent positive for that parasite. And out of all the coyote samples, we got one. What you can take out of that, I'm not really sure. We just did prove that they were sure, sure uh, carrying that. And what that, the life cycle on that is um, the ungulates pick it up off of the grass um, and they ingest it. It goes into the ungulates, hatches inside the gut, migrates into the muscle tissue and insists in it. And then when a canine, or well anything actually, ingests that uh, muscle tissue that is insisted with the larva, then it goes into the, the gut of that animal and then hatches out. And then they shed the eggs out through their feces and then off the feces the, the young goats pick it up again. Um, I think of another little, little thing we did. There's something else that we're working on. Oh, I'm going to say it wrong, it was, <laughs> I'm sure, but <coughs> Ingeococcus, I think. Um, I'd have to look it up to tell you for sure. Um, and that's, that's the one parasite that there was a lot of hoopla going on early in the wolf reintroduction thing. Um, and it's, it's supposed to be carried also by, by all canines. Um, but you know, all the wolves that they brought in here were were vaccinated and, and uh, given, uh, oh, I can't think of the word. Anyway, they, they were, yeah, they were, they were given the medicine to take care of the parasites. Um, and that, that was a big argument. Um, I think we proved that they do have them anyway. I'm sure that they did. But um, I was kind of surprised that we only came up with one coyote that was positive. 
we did come up with a coyote, so I guess that says that they could be, the coyotes could have been a carrier while the wolves were gone and then they got in the wolves. I, you know, there's a lot of speculation there, so. One other thing we do this time of year quite a bit is a lot of raven and crow work. We go around the river camp on the trees and three or four thousand crows try to get into the tree. They just showed up. Dave was talking about the vulture that they would use for a long trip or something. They didn't do that, they didn't get a meal, but they were going to be in town and they had their uh, and John Benson heard the heard the mayor, this one's kind of hit, and he was just like, we don't care what you do to them. And there was city blocks and sidewalks that wiped this dangerous thing to be in this same place. Um, anyways, uh, any of those blackbirds, crows, ravens. Strangely enough, coronavirus is one of them, but it's, it's a completely different strain than the one that we're dealing with here. So you, they also, the feces, they also carry a lot of uh, parasites and diseases that can be transmitted to humans as well. So it's, it's uh, not, all, not just a mess issue, it's a human health issue also if you've got a huge bunch of uh, birds roosting. Well, we did, we're not, we don't have like the 5,000 anymore. There's like a thousand or so show up, which is a good thing. But um, in town here, we were a little bit limited because they did let us shoot in certain places in town here. And the colder it gets, the more hard areas they are. They are in the town. So I just figured we'd give them a try. Um, but strangely enough, something that just petrifies them is the, the cheapest laser pointer pointer you can get at Walmart. You can run it up the street six or eight blocks away by the time it's getting dark and it'll go completely through every one of the pointer points. So that's, so that's something new. Yeah, yeah just uh, make it get more used to some fireworks and stuff that seems to try to get them to at least go someplace First two or three thousand of them down there at the post office. I think it was just pretty bad. How about an eagle to kill? Do you see enough that lands in in large bird or group? Yeah, the, the eagle stuff. That's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We don't get involved unless it's necessary. On a rare occasion, they let us uh, do soft catch traps and catch golden eagles. And federal administration can change it now unless they go back on the endangered list, which I guess is possible, but I'm hoping there's enough science behind it to keep it, but you know how science is in politics, they don't really care. So. They all care about it as long as they say it's on their side. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Any more questions? Have you got any research projects going on? We don't. Have you come up with one? No. <laughs> <laughs> you would, you we, we would like to have some. If you, if you give, come up with an idea, we'd like to have some. Rowdy, uh, if we can come up with some research projects, that will actually give us some. There's a small amount of money that's set aside through the Predator Board that is only for research or wildlife projects. Yeah. That's all it can be spent on. And we all get paid for it. And, uh, yeah. What are some examples? Huh? What are some examples? We've got a deer project right now at LifeSite, and I'm just trying to recruit uh, more deer fawns. Uh, almost non-existent deer in here. Yeah, so yeah we've had some, there was an antelope uh, <coughs> project
project, several animal projects in other parts of the state. The sage drought project was part of that. Um, um, I think of what else we had. Uh, we did a big one sheep uh, 10 years ago, but yeah. uh, for Nas, which is Revolution, North America Wild Sheep. Or whatever. Anyways, they, yeah. they paid for a project and did, a, did some work up around the big one sheep. Or whatever. But if, 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 uh, if we want to try to do some kind of a project, we've got to come up with a plan on it, go with the local biologists, um, game and fish biologists here, and get there okay. And then uh, we have to go to the meetings in the spring and present uh, to them a budget and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to prove. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a process. Thanks for coming and listening yep, to us. Is.